All right, I guess it's time we started our third installment of the Internet Forum lecture series. Uh, my name is Juho Kaivosia. I'm one of your friendly course assistants. And uh, unfortunately, the professor is unwell today and cannot attend, so it's my, my duty to, to introduce today's speakers. Uh, so, as, uh, as usual, we have two speakers today, Alexi Kopponen and uh, Marko Luhtala. And uh, Marko Luhtala is uh, our first speaker speaking about uh, leadership in digitalization. So, Marko, please. Good afternoon, everybody. So, as, as Juho mentioned, my topic is, is leadership in digitalization and specifically why majority of the businesses fail in the digital transformation. <clears throat> Quite often when, when you hear about presentations uh, of digitalization, it's about technology, it's about new type of services, products, companies, business models, all the opportunities we have in, in applying digitalization. Uh, I want to talk about what all can go wrong because, as I mentioned, majority of the businesses are failing in this transformation today. Ten years ago, I would say that uh, digitalization was a technology problem, but today that's not the case. It's a leadership challenge. Um, I've been involved in, in different roles in digitalization for 20 years. Back uh, in the first round of internet bubble, uh, late 90s, when it was called e-business, I, I saw through the burst of, of the bubble and then re-emergence of digitalization and the different phases. I've been early adopter, I've been uh, running fairly sizable businesses in, in Europe, Middle East, Africa and Asia, where I've been applying digitalization. I was software entrepreneur for seven years and now I'm consultant and advisor. So I've seen kind of different sides of the digitalization and also learned and, and make, uh, made uh, mistakes myself. Um, my presentation can be kind of summarized into this data point, which is a survey by McKinsey, that only 16% of the businesses have succeeded in the di digital transformation and achieved sustainable results. And, and uh, the sample for this study was a uh, few hundred companies, like global brands, uh, you know, major companies, and, and, you know, businesses that absolutely have access to all the knowledge and information, all the technology and all the technical resources there are on this planet. So having access to those assets uh, does not correlate whether you succeed in digital transformation or not. And if you think, I'm, I'm sure that you have read many, many studies about you know, transformations or change programs in general, there's kind of a um, law of nature that 30% uh, of the transformation programs succeed in general. But it seems to be that if you add this dose of digitalization, your likelihood of success is cut into half. Now, if I take uh, you know, a national view and put my Finland hat on, uh, you could uh, you know, ponder that if, if we in Finland could elevate the success rate of an average Finnish company from 16% to closer to this 30% in digitalization, what would it mean to the national economy, to employment and, and all that comes with that? Uh, digitalization is, is a very worn out term, it's, it's uh, misused, misunderstood and bastardized by consultants like me. And uh, so I want to you know, explain that what do I mean when, when I talk about digitalization. So to me it's really you know, building growth and competitive edge with digital technology. You know that service design is a hot topic, all the companies are doing service design, so you could think that Digitalization is, is like business design. It's, it's like redesigning your business using technology. 
And, and some of the key points, first, first of all, digitalization is not a strategy, it's not a separate strategy that the company should prepare. It's, it's um, like CEO's modern toolbox for doing better strategies and better execution. Another one is that um, for many, many companies and, and leaders, digitalization is, is a project or, or even an IT project. And I would claim that it's, it's first of all, definitely not an IT project. Obviously, it includes elements of implementing IT, but it's not also a project. It's a, it's a transition to what I call a digital economy, where many things are different from the way that we do business today. You, you sell different things, you sell in a different way, and, and the way that you make money, what kind of skills and processes you have, may be quite fundamentally different from the way that you do business today. And last but not least, the industries are transforming, so it's not really up to an individual company or a CEO to decide whether they want to join the bandwagon of digitalization. It's, it's a must. The question is rather that how you do it and, and what is the direction you take. If we then go into, you know, the kind of the core of this challenge that the businesses are facing, you could say that, that many drivers of the digital economy is, is actually challenging your secret source. And with the secret source, I mean like le the learned way of, of a company to make money, to be profitable, to grow, to serve your customers, to gain market share. That's Kind of every company, every successful company have a secret source that delivers profits and growth. And if you think about digitalization, there are kind of many drivers that are kind of changing these rules and, and, and the ways of, of doing business. So, for example, uh, kind of the service side is much more emphasized than before. The value is moving from hardware to the software. Um, you need to redesign the way that what is the division of labor between people and computers and, and sales and marketing and customer service are all moving into omnichannel. So these are kind of things that the drivers that, that are challenging your secret source in the digital economy. And when you kind of add uh, these on top of each other, you can call it the transformation or disruption. And, and it, it feels to kind of an established company that, that actually um, this competitive edge that you've had before may even turn into a competitive disadvantage. And it may feel that suddenly you are actually competing with companies that have, that have actually taken their or moved their goalpost outside of the stadium. So how do you score against that kind of a competitor and, and I used to work for Nokia for 15 years and I experienced this twice. Late 90s Nokia was disrupting the market by changing the way that the products are developed. So moving from individual products into product platforms so that suddenly we could introduce instead of one product every two years, 10 or 20 products in a single year. And, and we squashed a lot of competitors because they didn't have any space in the retail shelf anymore. Then came 2007, Apple launched iPhone and, and changed the game, you know, from hardware, from telecom technology into software and operating system and applications. And once again, you know, it felt like Apple moved their goalpost out of the stadium. How do you score against that kind of a player? And it's actually, I, I discussed with 16 experienced leaders and, and executives a uh, few months back, and, and I also asked them that, you know, what was the impulse in their current company to digitalization? And 40% said that it was actually, you know, mandatory. You know, shit had hit the fan. You know, their secret sauce had turned sour. And surprisingly, the more successful company you are, the longer you stick to your secret source and try to hang on to the ways that you have been successful in the past. Roughly 40% said that they had uh, visionary leadership. 
typically it meant that uh, the owners or the board had kind of thrown the previous CEO away who didn't wake up to the digitalization and they had brought a new CEO from outside of the company with the background of, of the digital economy. Then there were two other categories, uh, born to challenge and, and then the digitalization fits the culture. Uh, not surprisingly, these were almost all kind of entrepreneur-led companies. You didn't find any publicly listed companies in these two groups. And like one of the CEOs said that, you know, it's quite easy to recognize the need for change, but actually accepting that the change is also applying to us, even though we are still making money, is super diff difficult. Also, what I learned was that in, in many companies, there's this kind of duality in, in how senior people perceive digitalization. In one study that I made uh, in 2017 and 18, uh, over 40% of the executives said that to them digitalization is nothing more than a fancy name to an IT project. So, you know, that was their perception of digitalization. And you hear that quite often. Then, on the other hand, uh, when, when your management team or senior leaders get excited about digitalization, it can go totally overboard. You know, when, when you invite consultants or solution providers or technology geeks to your management team meetings, they can easily, you know, throw 10 ideas in one hour and none of them solve any problem that their customers actually have. But, you know, they are shiny things and, and you know, people get kind of oomph about what all can be done with the technology. Also, what is kind of surprising, uh, but, but kind of adds on to the same story why, why this is a leadership challenge and why businesses are failing. Um, I studied during two years, at least 20 or 30 companies quite thoroughly, and surprisingly only in 11% of these companies, the CEO and the chairman of the board agreed upon the impact and the direction of digitalization to their company. And there was no clear you know, division that which one was uh, thinking that it's more relevant and, and the other way around. But if you think that this, uh, this is kind of the duo that is really kind of setting the strategy for the company and agreeing upon the investments and, and the way forward. And if in you know, nine companies out of the ten, these guys, these captains kind of disagree that where they should steer the ship, then obviously it doesn't go anywhere. I think in, in, in general, much more. <laughs> obviously not 100%, but you know, in order for the CEO to keep their job, I'm sure that more than 50% of the topics they, they agree. But one thing that, it's actually a good point, one thing that I noticed is that they actually hadn't discussed, in most cases, they hadn't really had a thorough discussion, so it came as a surprise to them, uh, even to them, that, hey, <laughs> this is an important topic and we totally disagree. Good question. Another thing that, uh, you know, you encounter a lot is, is that will the heroes of the EBITDA mine fall behind EBITDA mine? I mean, you know, people that are hacking, going to work every morning to, to the EBITDA mine and hacking the profits so that they can make the quarterly numbers. And obviously, you know, there's nothing wrong. On, on the contrary, it's a virtue of making your numbers. But some businesses have made it uh, kind of a too extreme to the sense that it's almost an internal joke that that of course you can develop your business but you do it on your spare time and and only after you have delivered this month's numbers but the discussion that you quite often have is that you know digitalization so somebody has been appointed to you know be responsible for the digitalization and he or she says that you know we need uh, we need to invest in this one you know, we need to invest in technology, we need to invest in, uh, you know, new type of skills, external services, and, and by the way, uh, I need two years before it starts paying back. 
and and it's it's very easy for those people then in in the management team who are running the you know the current business to raise hand and say that yeah that's fine at, as long as you don't take our profits that we bring into the company and even though this sounds kind of uh, absurd that company is facing uh, potentially you know existential crisis in terms of uh, digital transformation and they are kind of pondering that whether they should invest money but this is this is very human um, kind of effect that that you actually have and and when the budgeting time comes they the executives face a big pressure to cut the digitalization budget proposals you're saying that you know take a bit and and you know prove yourself and then we'll give you a bit more that you know kind of sounds um, reasonable but if it means that you cannot recruit new people you just add hats on top of your existing hats and and you kind of pay a token to this transformation instead of kind of investing in uh, the amount that would be required to to create some, something sustainable it doesn't really help and and here's one of the ceos that i interviewed saying that uh, that you know actually five years back they had all laid out you know what they could be but they didn't have the courage and the money and now the competitors are actually moving into that space and and he said that you know if he he could go back he would do it differently but at that time he didn't another challenge with this kind of approach is that typically before this discussion about the investments the you know the leadership have made the slides the strategies and and saying that we want we will be leaders in this and that and we will you know apply digitalization and ai widely in our business and and talk about that to to the employees to the customers to the investors to the owners and those people remember it and and when there's nothing really happening or you know you paint a picture of a sun and then you deliver a flashlight then then there's like in any change program there's this best before effect that if if these kind of stakeholders don't see things being delivered they will actually kind of check out not only your customers but also your own employees will check out saying that okay this digitalization was all talk uh, but it's not really important because we are not investing in that. So summarizing why this is so difficult before moving into, you know, some of the things that, that the leaders can do, you know, four things. First of all, uh, there are kind of new business tools that people don't yet know how to use. And I'm not talking only about the technology, but also, you know, new business models, uh, new skills and competencies like when when so-called traditional company need to start recruiting software architects or data scientists or UX experts you know the, it's it's uncharted territory they they don't know what these people should be doing or even where to find them and 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 you know what what makes them tick then then the two other ones are that, that the changes are often non-linear and, and that also means that the strategy has a lot more uncertainty. So this is something that in, in the past, even when I started my business career last millennium, uh, you could quite easily kind of predict that what will happen in a business, you know, two, three, even four, five years ahead, you know, the direction was pretty clear the question was that who is able to execute best now it's not the case anymore uh, you know some of the ceos said that how do you know who will be your competitor next year the fourth bubble the company culture is is challenged and this is related to the secret source topic that i i already discussed that if you have learned to make money in a certain way, then, then your culture is, is kind of built around that and you tend to make decisions and, and run the business so that it, it kind of further strengthens your secret source. And, and it means that you, you try to kind of lower your risk level in 
other areas, you, you make safe bets, you recruit people that know your industry. You know, if somebody has been in your industry for 20 years, you, you think it, it's a good thing and it kind of brings in seniority. And now if you think about um, digitalization, you should be investing in things that are new and unsure. Uh, you should accept trial and error and you should definitely increase your team diversity and, and kind of deliberately recruit, recruit people outside of your industry that disagree with your current way of doing business. And if you have been successful for a long time within a certain you know, secret source, it tends to be that your culture is actually hindering your adoption of digitalization. A good way of kind of analyzing that, that what is the likelihood of a company to succeed or not, that, that when, when you hear a CEO or a senior leader explaining their strategy uh, three to five years out and, and there are you know, notions on digitalization and AI and you know, how they explain that what, what they will do when, when, when uh, you know, the time comes. But then you can ask that, okay, can you explain me that how your company will look like if and when you are able to execute your strategy. So obviously all the CEOs can draw the current uh, org chart. You know, we have this kind of structure, we have this kind of people, we have this kind of core processes. Most of the CEOs cannot even start drawing that how their company will look like if they happen to succeed in implementing their strategy. And it means that they don't really know what they are committing into when they have made that strategy and definitely they don't know what kind of changes and how drastic they need to do and when in order to get there. And since digitalization is a big change, typically it may be, you know, 40 degrees off the beaten path that they have been walking for the last 10 years, they will miss those junctions and they will learn later on that, hey, we should have done something two years ago in order to hit the strategy. Um, if you look at the company's readiness for digitalization, you could summarize that it, it depends on four areas. So vision for the digital economy, as, as we discussed earlier, and the company culture, and then the two lower uh, bubbles, uh, the competencies, both internal and external, and then obviously the ICT infrastructure, and, and uh, you know, you can use this model to score your own company and think that, you know, what, what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses. You could say that kind of the lower bubbles you can fix with money. You can fix your ICT infrastructure and you can get internal and external talents with money. The upper bubbles are at the heart of the kind of leadership and, and you cannot fix them with, with money. You cannot, you know, source the solution for those upper bubbles. If we now look at, uh, you know, what the leaders then should be doing, um, if you have this challenge that, that your board and your CEO and the leadership team don't really uh, agree on what is the impact of digitalization, so one way of approaching that is to have a common framework for the discussion that, hey, what is digitalization? A simple one is this, you know, digitalization can mean three things. It can mean this internal efficiency. It can mean improving the customer experience of the existing business. And it can mean kind of building new businesses using digital technology and data. And, and even, you know, discussing at this level, immediately those people that uh, used to say that digitalization is a fancy word for an IT project, can see that, hey, there are other, you know, uh, there's a gray scale in, in this concept. You know, we can talk about customer experience or even building new businesses. And also when you think about, you know, investments, uh, if you only focus on those shiny things that the consultants and IT providers say, kind of creating new businesses, uh, you can see that actually you know, if you have 100 money, 
uh, to spend that you should not put everything on the top layer but you need to also pay attention to internal efficiency and make sure that your current business and the current customer experience is top-notch. Another way of, of uh, you know slicing digitalization is to is to look at how do you what are the ways to create unique customer value through digitalization and, and this is my own framework. I'm sure that there are many others. Uh, this is quite a simple one. And, and basically what I claim is that you can create additional customer value in, in four ways. First one is making your products and services smarter. You know, you have smartphones, you have smart buildings, you have smart refrigerators, you have smart this and that. And it all makes sense. You connect your products and services, uh, make them intelligent, adaptive, personalized, etc. Second one is applying new digital business models and, and you know, adding digital services into your product portfolio. Once again, makes sense. Third one is, is kind of using technology to scale your sales and operations uh, in a way that was not previously possible without high capital expenditure. And the fourth one, which is one of my own favorites, is that instead of just storing data, you can turn it into a strategic asset and, and create value and, and even make money with that. So once again, when, when, when the leadership team uh, you know, lists all kind of opportunities and possibilities, what they can do, one way of uh, you know, slicing and dicing the topic is to slot them under these four topics and see that whether there's an overrepresentation in one corner and have they kind of missed a certain certain uh, topic out of these four. When the leadership team uh, is creating kind of the vision for the future, it's it's actually uh, quite recommendable to visit the future, and it's it's uh, it's possible because. Many, many companies have been you know, implementing digitalization activities. There are examples from almost all the industries. Some of them are good examples, some of them are bad examples. But there are kind of multiple ways, all those uh, areas that, that how you can actually um, have a glimpse of the future uh, and, and bring that common understanding into your leadership team. As, as one of the CEOs said, uh, the management needs a quick tour to digitalization that consists of indisputable examples and ambition, ambitious goals. Then when, when you are building this common vision, and I, I just cannot overemphasize this, that, that the CEO and the chairman or, or the board just has, they have to be, it's not enough that 11% of the companies kind of this duo agrees on, on what is digitalization, it, it has to be 100%. And, and it means that obviously the board will ask the CEO that what will happen in the industry and what is our strategy in the digital economy? And it's a fair question. And the CEO and the leadership team must be able to answer that. But at the same notion, when, when the CEO gives that answer, he needs to ask the board back that do we understand the effects in the same way and do we want to go there? Because it will have impact on the investments, it will have the impact on you know, the, the strategy, it will have impact on the, how the company will look like in a few years' time. And obviously, you know, if this dialogue doesn't take place, then it will turn into tears. Then when, when the CEO and board agree, then obviously the CEO needs to make sure that the leadership team is awake. And, and um, you know, there are three topic or points in here. One is that what is the understanding of the team about the digitalization and its significance? It's unrealistic to assume that the whole leadership team of so-called, you know, traditional company would suddenly be born digital and, and you know, digitally savvy experts, but the CEO needs, you know, few people there to, to basically uh, ignite the flame and, and, and get the transition started. The second one is that does the team have an appropriate sense of urgency? And obviously this goes back to the investment discussion and the budgets and the heroes of the EBITDA mine. 
Uh, one concrete way of measuring this is that, that how seriously we take digitalization in the strategy and uh, what kind of actions and investments uh, the leadership team is willing to make. And the third one is that th does the senior management can stick its own neck out. Um, what I've learned is that, that uh, kind of digitalization is such a big change that, that this kind of rational commitment is not enough. If the senior leaders are not you know, passionate or at least curious at the personal level, uh, it will not uh, work out. And, and there are a couple of things that how you can measure this one. One is that when, when different you know, leadership team members talk about uh, digitalization, you, know, you can quite easily um, see that whether they have made their own slides and, and speeches or are they just kind of repeating what somebody else in the organization have have uh, written to them. And if, if it's the latter, it, it sounds horrible. And another one is that many companies, at least it used to be quite popular that, that businesses recruit a chief digital officer, you know, as a transformation leader. And, and um, uh, unfortunately, in, in many companies, it was an excuse from the rest of the management team or leadership team to outsource digitalization to this one poor, poor person who's you know, task was basically impossible because everybody else in the leadership team was continuing running the old business using the old secret source. A good acid test for the leadership team is that, that I, I didn't put here if it comes, but when the time comes, are you ready to cannibalize your existing business to build a new one? Quite often if you are so-called, you know, traditional company, uh, at some point of a time, the kind of the new digital economy and the new offering that comes with that is going to cannibalize your old business. And it's, it's surprisingly difficult for any company that have been successful in building and selling something suddenly, you know, say that, hey, now let's, let's, let let's have this slide and build a new business. And it's, it's more often that actually it, it will be a, some, a competitor that is doing it first. There are certain examples of businesses that are you know, actively cannibalizing their own existing old business and they, they typically are very agile. Some, sometimes they do it too early. Obviously you don't want to do that. But uh, when you go through this transformation, the leadership team must be ready at some point of a time asking this question, are we ready to cannibalize our existing business? Um, good news for you know, leaders is that, that basically all the businesses and all the organizations move through the same phases when they kind of proceed in this uh, digitalization journey towards the digital economy. And, and this is the model that, that I've built, uh, four phases, awakening, trial, scaling, and, and business as usual. And as you can see, uh, these are kind of the typical challenges, some of them we've been discussing today. And, and the good news is, as I said, you know, most of the businesses go through all the same phases and face the same challenges that that you can really kind of get kind of uh, peer benchmarks, not only in your own industry, but also the neighboring industries that, you know, what are the best ways and means to move from one phase to the next one in a successful manner. Obviously, you know, when you hit the business as usual, uh, you cannot rest on your laurels because there's kind of a next phase of uh, new technologies enabling you know, new way of doing business, new type of offering and business model. So this, this actually should be a cycle that, that when you feel comfortable, you should get worried because then you need to awake again. There's something new happening and then you go through this circle once again. Uh, I also have a table where, you know, for each phase and, and challenge, there's, you know, recommendation what the leadership 
should be doing. I don't go it through today uh, for time reasons, but I'll, I'll tell you shortly if you are interested in reading that way to download it. Uh, instead, as, as my you know, last point, um, I want to present you kind of a checklist of five questions that is uh, all the organizations can basically evaluate that well, what is their readiness and uh, what, what is their you know, current uh, expectation regarding the digital economy. Are they going to be part of the 16% who achieve sustainable results or 84% that fail? So the first question, does the leadership team have an appealing vision and a shared view of the digitalization? Yes or no? Second, does your culture support the transition to the digital economy? Yes or no? Third, do you know how the company will look like in three to five years? What digital skills and processes are needed? Yes or no? Fourth one, have your customers accepted and salespeople adopted the new digital services and business models that you have created? A big challenge typically. Yes or no? And last but not least, have you engaged data and AI widely in the decision making? Yes or no? And, and you could say that if you can tick three or more, uh, you have a good chance of succeeding. If you tick you know, one or two or none, uh, I think uh, as a leadership team, you, you need to work on those topics because with the current um, uh, you know, way, you will definitely end up on this 84% group that, that has failed in, in the digital transformation. So thank you from my part. Um, if you want to download some of my presentations or, or the report that I was referring to, the report here is uh, in Finnish, it's also in English at www.ajantasala.fi and uh, uh, there's no, I don't collect any contact information, you don't need to submit your email, so there's no risk of ending up in, into any newsletter or spam list. Uh, feel free to download and, and read and you know, give feedback. Uh, if you find them interesting or if you have, uh, obviously, uh, some other views. Thank you. You are back to you. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Marco. Uh, any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, thank you very um, for the presentation. I'd just like to ask um, a very brief question. I'm learning from the Nokia 2007 experience. Um, how would you, if, for example, you are consulted now, mm. um, now let's um, cast our mind back to 2007 at that point in time, um, how would you know when to exactly spice up your, um, your source, um, your secret source? And um, how soon do you think it's necessary to either take your digitalization strategy to the next level or mimicking the secret way in which um, Apple managed to um, take over the market, take your post outside of the stadium? Yeah. Well, first of all, if, if you have you know, a secret source that is working, um, it's, it's quite a challenge to you know, start uh, working against that. Uh, but what you need to do is, is really, you know, through trials, kind of prove that the new way of, you know, this new nucleus of uh, secret source can also work. And, and also what you need to do is that have all these trials uh, together with the customers. It's like a way that the startups work. And, and, you know, have the minimum viable product, you know, have the proof of concept, you know, prove that, you know, this kind of digital solution actually delivers more value to your customers than the existing business. That's the only way to, to kind of move forward. Uh, but still there's this massive you know, chasm between trials and the scaling. Uh, because when you introduce a uh, new type of offering that is based on totally different processes and skills, how do you, you know, start 
transforming your existing core so that this kind of new business is not just a stamp on top of the book, but it's, it's really uh, kind of cuts through the, the layers of your organization and processes. So it's uh, kind of through the trials, you can test the secret sauce, but still the biggest challenge is that how do you move from trials to scaling? Hopefully I answered your question. Okay, thank you for a valuable presentation. It was an interesting talk. Um, you have given us lots of advices what to do, and uh, you have um, presented key issues as well. And um, with all those questions in the end, it already felt more like a roadmap towards mm. digitalization. So I want to ask um, how universally applicable this is from your perspective, or uh, at what point you need to start um, apply some context-specific weights, or is this applicable to all kinds of uh, businesses, organizations, institutions, whatsoever? Yeah, I don't. Uh, I haven't found out any, you know, fundamental differences, uh, for example, between industries. Um, Obviously, if you are a huge company working globally, having multiple product lines, this, this may be that you have kind of multiple transformations, even at the broader product group level, compared to a smaller company. I would expect that this applies to the university as well as to any, you know, profit-seeking organization. So this is, because it, it is a leadership issue. It's, uh, it's, you know, we are dealing with, even though we talk about technology, we are de dealing with people. And, and any organization, uh, I would claim that go through these phases and face the same challenges. Feel free to disagree. <laughs> Jolly good. Thank you for your questions and enjoy the next presentation. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to be here and it actually it's great to continue on, on Marco's presentation since uh, as far as I'm concerned, I agree on everything. And I come from uh, Ministry of Finance from Finland and, and we have in, in our ministry, we hold the legislation for public sector ICT and information management. And that's why this public sector ICT department uh, lies within the Ministry of Finance in Finland and when it goes to other countries, every country hold their own ways of holding these, these public initiatives and, and mandates and legislation but in basically in Finland uh, we hold the general laws for digitalization and digitalizing uh, public governance. Uh, my own background comes from, uh, I'm Master of Science in Automation Technologies and I've studied uh, specifically machine vision and uh, machine learning technologies and that is the uh, place I started with these ideas and <laughs> what I'm doing in, in ministry right now. So I'm helping our nation to transform itself into the age of AI. So these AI activities is, are, are uh, rather huge, a uh, huge topic on every country's agenda in the world. So, so as well in Finland. So that's why we need to consider those issues as well. And I, I will be giving you some introduction uh, globally. And uh, as we are talking about the society, uh, we cannot consider just the basic assumptions th that goes to the uh, normal organizational transformation or digitalization. We need to consider simultaneously 
multiple and multiple and various uh, challenges since <laughs> we are a society. So that's why we cannot just start transforming something that we like. But uh, I will be giving you a, an example of, of how we have aligned our strategies right now and what we are planning to do in the next three or four years. And you can see in this picture uh, our, our uh, strategy or, or uh, initiative uh, that says the AI Finland, it's, it's like towards to the age of artificial intelligence. And this is basically the narrative that goes uh, throughout the whole Europe. But I, I, will, I will give you an introduction why, why uh, we as a Finland are uh, in much more fast paced in, 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 in the whole Europe as, as other countries. But basically how we are approaching this transformation it's actually rather the same as, as Marco presented before me. It, it, it is because of our people, it, it is because of our organization and our society as a whole. So basically, of course, we don't consider our governments uh, uh, like that important tool to, to have like uh, the, uh, be before our citizens. So we need to put our citizens uh, at the center of this transformation and I will give you some ideas of what that really means in practice. Uh, this transformation needs to be considered uh, different and various ways. I will give you ideas about the, the uh, number six, we will build the world's best public services and give you some ideas about how we are doing this in Finland. And you need to consider that, that this is just our country uh, with a population of around 5.5 million. And there are uh, uh, tens and tens of different countries that are heading their own uh, AI strategies and initiatives. So, so every country are pushing their digitalization different and various ways. But in general, in, in Europe, we are cooperating with the European countries since we are in the <laughs> in, in European Union and we hold the new European Commission that holds uh, their own agenda for the next next commission phase. Uh, I will show you a few uh, indices and uh, sum summaries of how we look the world and different countries and how, how our countries varies. But basically, Finland has been among the most digital countries worldwide, like maybe the last decade or so. But basically, I, I argue that that, that uh, goal hasn't been a goal for us. So that is just the basic work that we have been doing with the with the uh, di uh, digital and technologies that already exists and we have just uh, utilized those for the benefit of our people. So that's why we are on top of lots of different kind of uh, indicators. For example, ego indicators are uh, indicators that indicate, in, for example, in this sense, the Sandesi index and in, in this sense, fin Finland is number one in, in the whole sense when we are uh, comparing to, to various countries in Europe. And uh, there are lots of different kind of uh, approaches that we can use when comparing countries. And of course, we cannot just compare 100 uh, percent way the societies, since the societies varies in, in so many ways. But still, the connectivity, human capital, use of internet services, integration of digital technology and digital public services are summed, uh, summing the whole, whole bar uh, and, and says that Finland is <laughs> one of the most digitalized countries in the world. And this is the other 
other report that OECD that uh, has has made, and this is an actually actually a, a primer paper that you can find from from this website, and it basically says that there are three countries that nowadays emerge in when it goes to the AI activities. Finland is maybe one of the the most interested countries in the world uh, from perspective of OECD and how we approach uh, new age of AI and that that's why that is basically so interesting way that we have tried to uh, like set up made the setup for for the transformation that that is already uh, going on in Finland as well. Also, you can find Italy here and Canada. But uh, I was thinking when Marco said that, that you need to consider competition when you are digitalizing something. And, and if, if we are a society, what are we competing with? So we are Finland and we have 5.5 million people. And our basic legislation says that you need to consider the basic rights of our, your people and make make everything that, that they, they, are, they are doing great in their own lives. But what are we competing with? So I will argue that we are com competing with three different kind of futures that are already can be found from the world right now. And those approaches says that who controls our people. So basically the question is, do we like the idea that government controls the people or do we like the idea that private organizations control the people or do we like the idea that people themselves control themselves? So those are the three key futures and you can find all of these already existing in the world. And, and you might find from my <laughs> presentation that what are our approach considering this. Hints that that isn't the Big Brother Society. <coughs> so uh, this is another approach to understand the digitalization. That is, this is basically one sort of an indicator that indicates uh, the competitiveness of the societies. And there is the IMD World Digital Competitiveness ranking results from previous years. And the United States is, is on top of this. And you can find Finland from the seventh place. And you can also find the Nordics, Nordic countries here. Basically, uh, almost every country is here. And uh, that, that says something about how we are building our digital infrastructure and how we take advantage of, of the digitalization in our society, not just in, in our, in our uh, organizations, but merely the whole society in general. But the differences uh, w between, for example, United States and Finland is that uh, companies in United States doesn't too much care about their, their uh, government uh, when it goes to business. So they, they consider rather that, that public sector shouldn't be taken into account when, when pushing businesses further. So, and, and basically in Finland and in Europe in general, the approach is that we, we need to consider everything. Our, actually our uh, private companies are, are utilizing and, and using the assets our public governance has to offer. And I will give you some hints of those. And the performance when it goes again to the digitalization, and as Marco said, digitalization isn't about the IT. Of course, that is one part of the, the, uh, the transformation, but basically, if, when we are talking about the digitalization, we are talking about some sort of a transformation. Something is transforming from this phase to another. When it goes to, for example, butterflies, they host like four stages transformation in their own life circle. So that goes to the same idea 
when we are talking about the digitalization, you need to leave something behind to, to find something new f uh, in the future. And that is <laughs> maybe the cha most challenging part when it goes to digitalization. And that's, that is the reason why knowledge, as Marco showed in, in his presentation, that knowledge is, is on top of, of the, the indicators. Of course, we need technology, but we also need future readiness. And if we look after Finnish uh, state right now, you can see the IT integration uh, topping this, these uh, indicators, and we are lagging business agility. So these are just an examples about how, how different kind of challenges uh, different societies hold. And this is one, one picture of, of Finnish society. And we need lots of background to do this transformation. For example, the penetration rate in the digital technologies is, is like an, a paramount to do digitalization in a society. That basically says that do we have these devices? And does everybody hold these devices? Does everyone have their own computer? Does they ha do they have like, like s smart or IoT devices? How they are integrating themselves digitally into this world? And in Finland, the penetration rate is one of the highest in the world. And we also hold, uh, based on our historically histor historical uh, background, we hold the great amount of uh, register data uh, about our people. And this register data is, is located into the public sector, a different kind of registers. We, we don't hold the, like one, one big silo register that holds every, everything. We hold various kind of register and, and, and databases and we utilize them, utilizes those data wherever they are. And when I'm talking about the societal transformation, I don't talk about just public sector databases. We, I, I'm talking about any kind of data that you can find on, on public, public services, private sec sector services, or third sector services. Since we as a human are, are uh, whole people, and when we need different kind of services in different kind of stages of life, and that is the transformation we are seeking, and I will give you a few introduction into that. <coughs> but here comes the challenges and the competition. If I said that, that we have the three different approaches in the world, we also hold, of course, the competition when it goes to the uh, uh, economy. As Marco was saying about the, the data economy and platform economy, that is basically something that we need to achieve at a societal level. And that is something that we are trying to build in Finland right now. But we are lagging behind. And you, the United States and China are pushing the way bigger investments inside artificial intelligence uh, compared to European uh, companies or organizations. This is just an example about the uh, equity investments in AI startups. And you can see here that, that uh, in total, the, the amounts in, in, uh, in dollars, billions, you can see, uh, for example, in 2014, around 5 billion state dollars have, have been uh, used in, in AI startups. And, and la uh, two years back, it was more than 16, 16 uh, billion. And you can see the, the hint of, of the part of the European Union side. The, the major part goes to the United States located AI startups and Chinese startups. So we have lots, lots to be run in order to get these investments in European Union. And if we take the European Union here, we can see the United Kingdom that actually total 55% of all of the investments 
<laughs> and nowadays you can you can find the the uh, the, the uh, how, how can I say the prime minister from the United Kingdom uh, who actually made a uh, uh, speech in the United Nation. Have any of you uh, watched this speech? Totally. No one. Okay, so you, you will have these slides and you can go to this YouTube and search his presentation and actually <laughs> even though his narrative is rather uh, <laughs> funny, uh, still his message is very strong. So I strongly suggest that, that you see it. it's like 15 minutes of, of what are our key challenges when we are entering into the age of AI. And the key message for him is the same as I am presenting that are we controlling the technology or does the te technology control ourselves and our lives? And do we control our own lives or does our government or some third party control our lives? So those are the key questions we need to consider together as a society. And we are just, we as a, as a public governance just, just are raising the red flag here. So if we don't do anything, then, then we don't control the future. And that is something I argue right now. And we also lag behind uh, when it goes to the relative share of, of uh, digital share of ICT value added. So basically that means that how much investments we take out of the, the uh, digitalization. And in Finland, F Finnish, uh, Finland tops in Europe, but still we lag uh, the United States. And this is, this is European Union wide challenge. We don't invest enough in this transformation and these technological uh, uh, succe successors. For example, to our universities like Aalto or we should invest more in those. And as Mark, in Marco's presentation, you, you saw about how, how uh, different organizations are really investing in the change. And Marco said that, that there, there was like a piloting piloting setups in different stages and, and lots of studies reveal that, that uh, many companies lag uh, the challenges and, and the public, company, uh, public organizations as well lag uh, the way to uh, proceed from the piloting session to using at scale. So we test and try things and make maybe uh, MB MVPs but still, we don't take advantage of the real production phase in, in too much. And when it goes to the, this wave three, this is McKinsey's report. You can find this, that uh, lots of uh, uh, large companies' adoption in, for example, AI tools is rather small. So just 4% are using at scale across the entire em enterprise AI tools. So there, <laughs> there are lots of, lots to be Lots of people get, get uh, so that basically also means that there are enormous amount of potential to be released with AI. So I argue the same as, as Marco, that those companies that really transform themselves are the winners in the near future and the other ones are left behind. And this, this, this image shows the, the spread of AI readiness in Europe. And also here you can find Finland uh, topping uh, f fourth of this, this uh, list. You can find the United States compared to them. And the states are, are pushing forward and forward. Uh, and, and Finland is, is rather near when, when it goes to just to these, these <laughs> lights. But basically it says that we are on the, the phase to, to push everything in the production and hopefully we are doing that in this, this sen sense in next three years. And uh, as I was talking about the platform economy and as Marco was giving an example about the, the rise and, and destruction of Nokia 
as Nokia was lagging with the platform economy, where Apple really transformed the way uh, mobile business is being done. So basically, nowadays, the winning business model, non-arguably, is platform economy. And Apple, Alphabet, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft uh, are in, in the United States and in Asia you can find Tencent, Alibaba and Samsung. And this is like two years back uh, presentation. And in Europe you can find like just SAP. So we don't have like anything here when it, when it goes to this platform economy. We are just utilizing these services. And that's why we, those services and, and companies are so big. So how many of you have ordered anything from Alibaba? <laughs> okay, around 50% or a bit less. But still, this Alibaba of course makes their revenues out of those platform economy where are like hundreds of thousands of different organizations selling their own stuff inside their, their uh, platform economy. Uh, on top of the platform economy. And now in Finland we are struggling with our Stockman that is at the center of, of Helsinki. <coughs> but yeah, let's look uh, into one video that gives you some vision about the way if we have uh, the, uh, the music as well, I'm not sure whether or not it goes through. So uh, this isn't just a vision. There is ongoing activities and ongoing projects, projects that, that is being presented in this video. And the music actually comes from the, the uh, Finnish DNA. So there is a uh, uh, like heavy metal band called, called Apocalyptica that has uh, built this, this song on top of Finnish people's DNA. <laughs> Let's see if we can hear it.
So basically that video said that we need some heavy metal to do the chains. <coughs> I will give you two uh, other videos in this presentation as well. We have still 30 minutes left if you are sticking with me. But basically uh, that was some sort of a vision about our society, but there was lots of really ongoing activities and there are hundreds and hundreds of projects that sums the whole transformation in general when it goes to the societal change. We cannot make just one program and, and put all the eggs in one basket and hope that, that everything changes through this program. We need different kind of actors and pro programs to do that. But as we are in the European Union, this Mrs. Ursula von der, uh, von der Leyen, where is the name? Uh, here, von der Leyen. Uh, she's now leading the European Commission, and uh, in, in, in her keynote speech, she raised artificial intelligence and, and said that in the next 100 days, we should start building the artificial intelligence legislation in European Union. Well, that work hasn't been started yet uh, when it goes to our understanding, but let, let's see how it goes. <coughs> uh, this is our ministry, Mrs. Sirpa Patero, who is the other ministry in, in our Ministry of Finance. So we have two ministries. The other one is the Ministry of Finance uh, uh, from the, the uh, financial uh, aspect and Mrs. Sirpa Patero is leading the, the reforms and digitalization in, in Finland. <coughs> and uh, she's talking about here about this Aurora AI program and I will give you uh, some ideas about that, what that basically means and what we are doing in the next three or four years. But we are doing those not just as, as a Finland. Uh, we are do, uh, co cooperating with other countries for example, our beloved uh, friends from Estonia, they, they hold their own sister project and we are like <coughs> at, at this time uh <coughs> connecting these projects in order to push the societal rev, uh, reform uh, as, it, as, it full, as its fullest state uh, in, in our, both of our countries. <coughs> and we need lots of different kind of cooperation on expert level and Mr. Pekka Alapiatila is leading that work in the European Commission in this artificial intelligence high level expert group and basically you can see that, that when it goes to the ideas and the work that we have been doing in Finland that has been resonated in European Commission level, level and European level in general. So, so that, is, that is great thing since, since uh, we are pushing this human centricity forward and that basically means that we are, we are hoping that this, this third future that says that human controls their own lives will eventually win in, in, the, in this world uh, competition. Well, if you look at Finland uh, from digital perspective, this is one way to approach it. So this is our digital infrastructure that is already here. So when you are having an, a public uh, services, you already are using this digital infrastructure, whether or not you know that. You can find these e-identifications, e-authorizations, service catalog, I will talk about that in more detail, maps, messages and payments. And this data exchange layer is a technology that we shared, share with uh, Estonian uh, colleagues, so we hold the same technology with those people. And there is, o there is also another country uh, coming to this, this uh, institute that holds this, this uh, technology. This institute is called NIS. Nordic Institute for Interoperability Solutions. And when we were, and when Marco was talking about this platform economy, that is basically here, on, on top of everything. So, so we argue that that platform economy 
arises and, and builds and evolves around uh, people's real life events and, and the stage of life. And that is the approach that we are using in Aurora AI as well. And as we are like uh, open country, you can go on github.com slash VRKPA so you can find the, the source code here. <laughs> so, so everything that we have been doing in, in this, this uh, uh, digital infrastructure, you can find it on GitHub. So, so we don't make competitive edge by building uh, uh, immaterial rights behind our nation. We share these ideas. Have you heard that? Linux Turvals that, uh, and, and the Linux foundation of Linux came from, from uh, Finland. So this basically continues the same ideology. And this Finnish service catalog, that was one part of this digital infrastructure, is, is one, one key element when we are digitalizing our society in general. And that is one of our keys that helps us enter into the age of uh, smart services cooperating. And actually, I don't give you too much detailed ideas about these, these slides, about this, this uh, uh, service catalog. But basically, you can see this service catalog as a service and a database that holds every public services available in Finland and we hold uh, the legislation for this whole digital infrastructure. So basically the legislation says that if you are a public organization you need to use and utilize this digital infrastructure and you need to uh, describe your uh, services into this service catalog. So eventually that means, and basically that means, that if you go to suomi.fi and you search anything there, you can find every public services there. But <laughs> we are not trying to compete with Google. So of course, if you go to Google and you type anything and, and Google will be better on this basic search. But I will, I will give you an idea about what we are competing with this idea. And that goes to the next video. Wouldn't it be nice to live in a society where everyone can get personally tailored suggestions on, for example, places to study or work? The kind of society where businesses can flourish and new employees can be hired easily and where you can be offered a physiotherapy appointment when you need it. All this is possible. Society can be more proactive and anticipate needs when public services are also based on events in people's lives and in the business world. We have already taken steps in this direction, an example being the pre-completed tax return forms. Usually these only need checking over. When data is utilized effectively in all areas of life, smoothly joined up services are possible and data can be put to work for the benefit of customers. The government is then an enabler with services being provided on the basis of genuine needs of people and businesses. The data and the technology already exist. Now what we need is to change the way we do things. First, we need the right provider for each set of services. Then, by experimenting, we can ensure services that fit real events. And so, we can create proactive services together. Join us at Swami Digi to create something new and exciting. So, basically, what that video presented was basically what this digitalization all about. Digitalization is the way change of how we do things and that basically <laughs> says that we don't consider primarily technological breakthroughs. Of course we utilize those technological breakthroughs but, but first of all we need to consider uh, the things we need once 
that we are willing to change. And that goes to our ongoing activities in Finland. And <coughs> in, in last semester or June, we got our new government and they built this new governmental program. It called uh, Participa Participatory uh, Finland, basically. And uh, it's, it's uh, actually it's, it's like a rule book based on different kind of values. And the digitalization isn't explicitly insi uh, inside of that program, but everybody understood understands in Finland that in order to make these transformation and values out of this book we need this digitalization and that's why they say that that we will continue this Aurora AI net building this con uh, Aurora AI network and we are uh, as we are speaking we are in the middle of budgeting in Finland and hopefully actually in next week we know that what kind of assets and allocation and budgets are we having <coughs> to build this, this transformation in, in Finland. So, and I will give you now the idea with the last video about the vision of this Aurora AI. So, basically, with the Aurora AI, we will give the power back to the people to control their own life in their different life stages and events. So think about that vision, where you control your own life proactively. You can control your multidimensional well-being and can prepare of different kind of situation, whether or not they are hard or great or something that you are really looking forward and you control that situation. <coughs> so that's why we talk about the empowerment and this empowerment is at the heart of human centricity where people are empowered to utilize their own data for the benefit of themselves and no other uh, power is, is controlling people's lives or their data. We have utilized uh, different kind of approaches. Uh, here you can find two uh, frameworks. At the, at the center of this framework is a model we called Stiglitz model. It holds eight elements 
of our multidimensional well-being. So, you can find health, education, personal activities, including work, political voice and governance, social connections and relationships, material living standards, environment, security and insecurity. And basically this framework says that we cannot divide people in parts. Rather, we need to consider people as a whole. Uh, the other framework comes from the OECD, Compendium of OECD Wellbeing Indicators. And you can find, for example, uh, one, one perspective is uh, air pollution. And, or in this political voice and governance, voting turnout. Or social connection and relationships, contact with others. Or uh, ed in education, literacy. So, for example, in Finland, uh, <coughs> maybe all of you have been uh, visited Audi, its central library in Helsinki, and and actually Helsinki got uh, was uh, Audi was awarded uh, world's best new library in the world. So, so in Finland, we consider these well-being indicators. As it fullest, as it fullest, and hopefully in the future as well, we need to consider, like for example, these educational uh, uh, aspects more and more. But if we consider people as a whole, that basically <laughs> rises the first challenge when making this transformation. We have divided our legislative power into different organizations and silos, where. For example, in Finland, we hold 12 different ministries. And all of those ministries hold their own power and their own, own uh, state organizations that re execute their own legislative power. And in Finland, we also hold 313 municipalities. And all of those municipalities are independent. And in, in Finland, social and health care is uh, responsible for, for municipalities. And actually, seven, our seven previous governments have tried to, to make the reform uh, into the social and health care. And these governments are doing the same. Let's, let's see how it goes. <coughs> but all of these governments are trying to do the reform through organizational change and structural st change. And I am arguing that, that that kind of approach doesn't work. And I will show you a few reasons for that. If we look uh, life through our, our perspective, our people perspective, so let's see that I, I'm after, after this, this uh, event I will go to my home and I have three kids and I'm having having a, a, a night with them and that's normal life but in this normal life I have different kind of challenges or different kind of uh, things on my mind and something might happen and uh, in, in, in that sense when we are looking from pr people's perspective uh, life we can find different kind of real challenges. Let it, let's say it's a childbirth or uh, uh, retiring or remaining in the labor market through lifelong learning or anything that it is a huge shift in our uh, life. So in these shifts, we don't consider these <laughs> organizations or like like what kind of services should I take from the state and what, what, what our, our uh, municipalities are offering me into this childbirth or what, do I, what kind of services do I need from the third sector organizations. I just consider this life event, right? So basically I don't too much care about what kind of organizations are adding value into my, not my life event. And that's, that is the reason as well to these social and healthcare and big, great reforms 
that we are trying to achieve. Uh, we, we try to achieve solving complex challenges by solving it in a in, in, uh, uh, complicated w way. So we, look, we still look our, our organizational structure as a complicated one, but the challenges are complex ones. So that's why we need to consider the new operating models and the way we do things, as the video said. And we have utilized AI, for example, when building the better understanding of the multidimensional uh, well-being and situation of our citizens or people living in Finland or in our society. And without this kind of approach, where we gather 360 perspective, different kind of organizations together to, make, to, to create a common ground and common understanding about the multidimensional well-being of our people. Without this, we cannot proceed into the human-centric era and into the age of AI in, in a human-centric and ethical way. That's because nowadays, if you look on the picture on the left, uh, this is a uh, nowadays situation where every one of these uh, organizations tries to understand our society from their perspective. And they are building their, their own services, basically own end services. They are not building platform economy. They are building their own, like you go to website and, and you type something in that. That is basically one, one end service for the ministry or provinces or company. But in this sense, we try to build the common understanding about the, the uh, service ecosystem of what kind of services these people who are in this situation really need. And that is, the, that is one of the key values that we can, we can take out of the artificial intelligence or, let's say, neural networks. So we have utilized neural networks uh, in order to make these clusteral analyses where these clusters are combined around different kind of people's real needs. So through these clusters we have segmented our people and that doesn't mean that we are building a big brother society. Rather it means that we understand better and better of what kind of people uh, here really are in Finland. So basically this is an example of people living in Turku and st studying in Turku and there is for example uh, 68 people struggling with their worries and this kind of data can be built uh, by utilizing neural networks uh, and that is just an example of, of utilizing those uh, mathematical models and with this kind of situational analysis we, st we can start to understand the platform economy that should be uh, built upon these clusters or segments. So let's say we need to, we, now, now we understand that okay we have 68 people struggling with their worries and they have lots of worrying with their financial assets and their environmental stuff and, and social networks and etc. We also understand that they have lots of babies. So ba basically, if you are having a child, then you are struggling with your worries. <laughs> so, so of course, that doesn't necessarily end up in here, but, but basically you have more worries, of course, if you hold a small child. And if you go to the uh, the lowest right on this picture, you can find active females in their social relations and careers. So basically, lots of females are in this segment. And what this image tells us, it basically says that these people in this cluster, in this cluster, basically doesn't need any more new services, right? They already can manage their own lives, but you can find lots of different kind of people here and here. Here is, for example, people in a need for mental health support. 
Think about it. If, you now, if we now know that in these clusters, the biggest challenges uh, and risks when it goes to the mental health is here. Should we do something and, and consider these mental services into this cluster? So this is the way we try to understand and like uh, prov make the provision of services more better and better way. <coughs> and that's why we utilize this life event approach. So you can consider this life event as a systemical slice of a cake, of a societal cake. So let's say the, the society in general is a cake. And now we take a systemical piece out of this cake and that, that, that cake slice is life event. So <coughs> we can give some sort of a life event to this slice. And let's say it's, here is a, a woman who's willing to change job without an unemployment period. Would that be nice? to not, uh, not be unemployed in our society. So of course nowadays you can just go and, and learn something new and, and try to find new employee, uh, employer, uh, employee and, and, and maybe negotiate a better wage or sa salary or anything. But basically that needs uh, uh, some decision making from her perspective. But now goes to the Aurora AI perspective and how she can utilize her own my data. In Finland, we hold uh, legislation, for example, for we called it Koski legislation that basically says that in, in uh, educational agency holds the uh, data database that holds every proven data uh, for our studies and you can utilize those data uh, for your own benefit. And, but still we, still we lack in Finland and in the world in general this kind of digital twin or digital me that combines every of those aspects of our lives. And through those we can utilize and create like 360 model of ourselves to be used in these services in order to these services to make op, uh, optimized clusters and optimized service cu clusters around people's life event. So basically when people are moving into this life event, of course these services are uh, attracted through this data that says something about herself. And as I was mentioned, we are, not, we are not building Big Brother Society. We are building a way wh how, how these people in, in, uh, in Finland can utilize their own my data ethically and in and, 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 a uh, cyber secure way. And that is <coughs> one of the last slides. So the high level architecture for this approach is, again, we start by building, uh, putting our citizens and the organizations first and try to understand the state of welfare of our people. And this understand, understanding of this welfare is being done by intentional analysis. So this intentional analysis is being done through chatbots and and, and uh, dialogue bots and dialogue so, uh, software that are discussing and having debates and discussions 24 seven with our people. And with these and through these dialogues, we understand more better and better what are the real needs of our people. And that is the way we can utilize the service catalog I mentioned. We all, you, you can also, you, at this phase you can find every public uh, services in, in this service catalog. In the future you will, you will find public uh, private uh, organization services and, and third sector services as well from there. And as I was mentioning through this live event approach we are optimizing this service ecosystem. It's like a new space or new internet but 
in, a, in an ethical way. So, so we, what we do as a government, we govern these smart services to, to be utilized ethically and cyber secure way. So there, there cannot be any service that, that uh, uses your data against you or, or our society. <coughs> and that's why this whole change isn't just about how we change just one organization in our society, whether or not it's a private or public or third sector organization. We need to consider these service ecosystems in general and at the same time the platforms that, that it lies uh, with behind those service ecosystems, we need to consider information management that goes cross-sectoral way from public to private to third sector organizations where we utilize my data for the benefit of people. We need to consider know-how investments and that basically is one of the one of the biggest transformation uh, challenge since we are allocating money by allocating money into organizations but in this sense we can allocate money behind people's real needs and that basically changes everything in on investments we also need to consider legislation and leadership nowadays we talk about leadership by leading organization in this sense, we are leading these ecosystems and that is great challenge as well. And in Finland, as we are entering into the age of AI, our digital and physical platforms are rather in great shape. So we have 5G and, and the 6G is, is <laughs> hopefully coming sometime. And, and the, the greatest challenge goes to the data interoperability stuff. So those aren't just technical challenges or semantical challenges. They are also legislative challenges since in Finland you cannot move public data without legislation so, and uh, private data. If you are, have hold any kind of social and healthcare data that is strictly uh, legislated and mandated by law of, of who, who can be utilize your data and that is great actually because that builds trust within the nation. And <coughs> just few slides so I don't, there are too much uh, to be discussed, but uh, when we are talking about the artificial intelligence, you can divide AI in cognitive automation and robotic process automation. So basically this cognitive automation is the part of the AI that actually represents of the, the deep learning or or, or supervised learning or unsupervised learning. And when we are <coughs> making these kind of rollouts in a society, I just push, put stress on few things. Of, first of all, we need to supervise all new cognitive automation learning. So when we are giving p power to our computers, we, tannas, we, we cannot just put them on production and let's see what happens. If you remember few few years back it was maybe Microsoft's project where they built a Twitter bot and it basically came a Nazi. So, so we need to consider these biases that these uh, technologies will arise. And <laughs> this is rather important. Fix discoveries about process flaws before implementing CA. So you, you don't you shouldn't implement any cognitive automation without changing the process. So we are not just di digitalizing the, the old process. We are really transforming the way we do things. So we need to consider the first of all this transformation and after that uh, the CA things. So basically that was uh, what I was supposed to. Oh, actually it's three minutes over. So this is my last slide. So if we are willing to make this transformation, we need to leave something behind uh, to go forward. And that is maybe the biggest challenge for our, for our society to make the change. Okay, thanks.
So nobody is sleeping. <laughs> are already a little bit over, but uh, just quickly a few questions. Thank you for a very good presentation. I was wondering now that everybody will c become aware of all the services that are available for them. So it will probably mean more and more customers to the public services. The, I mean, the, the level of services will rise. So ha yeah. has the country budgeted for the increase of the customers who previously didn't, didn't know of all the services yeah, that would be yeah. available? Well, that is a great question since, since we have uh, if you go to social exclusion services, you can find 400 services from the suomi.fi service catalog. And what really happens when people are utilizing those services? Well, I think, uh, of course, it event, uh, first of all, it rises the, the uh, uh, costs of, of using these services, but that's why those services are there for. So, so that's, that's why we need to consider this, we call it kohtaanto. So the, the uh, when these services are giving to our people, it's more better that these people who really are needing these services are going to these services. And those people who really don't yet need those services are utilizing proactively some other services. So basically we are hoping that this approach will eventually be much better than just people wandering in around with different services. Okay, thanks. It was an interesting talk. So, um, this is a really ingenious way to kind of uh, combine business interests into a welfare project, right? Um, yeah. So, I'm just wondering, how do you think it will change the nature of inequality that we have in our society? We have inequality, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. And well, it will stay. It, uh, yeah, yeah. But how will this change the nature of it? Well, basically, the hypothesis is that it will strengthen the the equality, but that doesn't comes like granted. So we need to work and work and work with the the uh, uh, equality of the services. But basically, when we are optimizing these service ecosystems around people's real needs, at least as far as I'm concerned, it really strengthens the equality since those services that really brings value to our people are really, really coming on top of their, their um, uh, really decision making. So if, if people are really willing to use these services, then we can really proactively uh, give those services to be used. And basically, everything that I was talking about, these technological issues, people in our, our society doesn't need to know about these technological gadgets behind these service networks. So eventually it goes to the end services of how we are giving these dialog bots. For example, uh, all older ones can still call to, to their doctors, but, but in the future there there isn't, first of all, the real physical doctor, there is a chatbot uh, that she's or he's uh, discussing with. So we need to integrate this technological into the real life. Yeah, great question. And, and maybe the, the, the last answer for that is we need to be make this transformation together. So we need everybody involved. So, so th those people who are excluded or or uh, are having these these uh, issues with with their like uh, privileges or anything um, thank you very much for the presentation um, I just want to ask a qu very quick one um, so from your uh, experience working in the um, finance ministry or Ministry of Finance yeah um, what do you suggest to the minister or the committees working in the uh, ministry in order for Finland, for example, to catch up with the rest of the world, um, the United States, China, in this um, <coughs> struggle to at attain a great achievement in the AI, um, um, digital economy, disruption, and things like that. Yeah, so, so you were basically asking how we are trying to uh, compete with the, the other uh, state of the world. So actually, 
we set the new rules. So we try to set the new rules where people are controlling their data. And that is a very different ga game from, from the idea where uh, these closed ecosystems, let's say Facebook or Apple or Google, are controlling their own ecosystems. Or when it goes to the Asian, Asian ways where, where, uh, uh, where, where governments are controlling their people. So, so we, we play different game. And of course, we need to figure out how we really push it on production. And we, of course, uh, Europe isn't a, a great state like the United States. We are not so unified. We hold a very different kind of countries in our societies. So that is something that we just need to push forward. And we need to consider ourselves as a forerunner and hope that <laughs> other countries are coming with us to the same direction. <laughs> Let's see how it goes. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you.